Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Managing Your Time. My name is Talia Hoffman. I'm the training coordinator here at CWD and I'll be administering the webinar. If you haven't, once again, please be sure to answer our poll to receive credit for attending. Um, questions can be entered in the chat box at any time. We'll respond to them at the end. And let me introduce Sarah Staley, who is going to be leading today's webinar. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to have everyone join us today. I'm looking forward to spending the next hour or so talking about managing your time. Uh, as you know from the description, we are planning to really help you think about how to get through your work a little bit more efficiently, how to take the uh, best approach to prioritizing, and we're hoping you can take advantage of the 24 hours we all have in the day. That's our finite resource, so how we choose to use it is up to us, but we're hoping to help you make some good choices. So I'm excited to work with you here. Uh, I've been at CWD for about nine years teaching about productivity and organization, and I also teach the Getting Organized class. So if you've been through that class, you may see some similar ideas here. It's always good to have some repetition. And uh, this is our quick managing your time um, take, so it's nice to have a chance to do this as efficiently, hopefully, as possible. So we hope you get a lot out of it. You should have received an email from Talia this morning with a participant guide. I would highly recommend that you have that open on your computer, or if you printed it out, that's great too. But we will be referring to that throughout the presentation. So just a little more on what we're going to do. Uh, we are going to be talking about styles of time management because we found that it's best to kind of know your own personal style and work with it versus trying to work against it. So we don't all manage our time the same way as we go through the presentation. Think about what you're doing that works well for you, what you might want to do differently, and whether your natural style is where it's helping you, where it might be getting in the way, and how you want to work with it. Secondly, we're going to be talking about prioritizing. We're going to be taking a lot from our getting organized gurus, particularly uh, David Allen, um, and talking about some of his tools, as well as Franklin Covey, who has a great prioritization tool that we'll take you through. And finally, we're going to talk about processing. So you have so much stuff coming at you throughout the day. You have emails, you have voicemails, you have webinars, you have all sorts of things to manage and make choices about. So we're going to equip you with a few models to make good choices uh, so that you really only touch things that you need to once or perhaps touch it, make a decision, get back to it when you need to, uh, and it doesn't take up extra time. So that's where we're headed today. As Talia said, please jump in on the chat box with questions or comments, and we will take questions at the end. Um, go ahead. So to get our juices flowing, I want you to do a quick activity. You can either do this in your participant guide uh, on page three. There's a blank page for you, or you can open up a Word document. You can grab a Post-it, whatever you want to do. But I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes now to do a brain dump. So from your head to the paper or to the computer, write down everything that you have to do, whether it's personal, professional, short term, long term, uh, something you need to do in the next hour, hopefully not, uh, but in the next uh, day versus something that you'd like to do in the next three to five years. Whatever's come in your head, put it down on paper in whatever order it comes to our brains. Don't usually think very linearly, so have at it, go for quantity. While you're doing that, we're going to show you some examples. You have some examples on this slide meetings, birthdays, responding to a voicemail, scheduling your trip to Maui, who knows what is coming to your head right now, but start dumping that somewhere on a page. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So here's a few more examples while you're getting your own brain dump list going. A birthday card for mom. Then reply to Phil about the department meeting time. So this is how our brains go. We go from that personal thing we need to that professional thing we need, to that kind of really important thing like the expense report, uh, you're going to have all those things in your head at one time. So just get them out of your head, calling the mechanic about the brake pads, the presentation at the conference, uh, the HR policy, reading it, 
some of these things are big projects, some of them are little projects, some of them aren't projects at all, just things you need to get done. Uh, so hopefully I've talked enough that you've got a good list rolling. I'll give you just a minute more to wrap up, and then we'll go ahead. Okay, so you should have a brain dump in front of you, and I'm going to invite you to turn to page four in your participant guide. I'm going to have Talia bring it up so you can see in case you didn't get it or in case it's not in front of you. Uh, this is what we're talking about. We're going to go to page four. So this is the Covey Priority Matrix, and basically this is to help you prioritize between things that are important and not as important, and things that are urgent and perhaps not as urgent. And that's an important one because sometimes the things that are important are urgent, but sometimes they're not, and they can go by the wayside if you don't put some urgency behind them. So I'm going to talk about Quadrant 1 because we're going to spend a lot of our time there. These are the crises, these are the things with deadlines, these are the things that come up last minute that you have to deal with. So as you look over your list, I bet you see a lot of those popping up. Things that happened this morning that you're saying, I've got to get to that. Things that you knew were on your um, deadline-driven list today. Uh, as you look through your brain dump list, put a one next to anything that you think is urgent and important. So depending on the nature of your role, you might spend a lot of time in Quadrant 1. Oftentimes, if you're a front desk person, if you're IT support, uh, if you're operations, being in Quadrant 1 is an important part of your job. You are responsive to customers, to problems that come up, and you need to sometimes drop everything and really deal with what's at hand. However, a lot of us end up spending too much time in Quadrant 1 when we might have been able to avoid some crises if we spent more time in Quadrant 2. So as you look at Quadrant 2, this is called the Quadrant of Quality or Personal Leadership. Uh, and this is where our planning, our relationship building, taking care of ourselves, taking care of things that don't have a deadline but are just as important, these are where things can slip because they don't have that urgency behind them. So take a look at your list and see if there's anything that might be quadrant two and put a two next to that on your brain dump list. Sometimes when you look at your list, you see quadrant two things that have been on there a long time, and that's because we haven't put the urgency around them. So if you're kind of seeing the same thing over and over, sometimes it's time to make a choice. Is this really important? And if so, how do I bring it to the forefront? If it's not as important, then maybe I need to let it go. The planning is key. If we spend more time in quadrant two, oftentimes we can avoid getting pushed into quadrant one. So that's really the takeaway I'd give you here. I'll send you an email after this webinar with a online assessment you can take to see how you're spending your time. Uh, and just push yourself to spend a little bit more time in quadrant two and see if it can help with quadrant one. I'll talk briefly about quadrant three and four. So three, these are the things that kind of are not as important when you think about your own personal priorities meetings, interruptions, phone calls. You're going to have to spend some time here, but this is where you need to manage your own time a little bit, sometimes set some boundaries, say I'll get back to you in 24 hours, I'll get back to you at the end of the week, and just give yourself a little bit of room to maneuver so that you can get those important things done. And then there's Quadrant 4, and we're going to spend some time here too. Oftentimes, if we spend a lot of time in Quadrant 1, then we also spend a lot of time in Quadrant 4 because we get burnt out or we get exhausted and we just need some time to ourselves. Again, sometimes when we're in Quadrant 4, we could do something in Quadrant 2 that might be more productive, to get up, to take a walk, to have coffee with a friend, 
that might also help relieve some of that stress of Quadrant 1. So if you have any questions about this, please type them in the chat box, um, and we'll come back to them later. So I think this slide summarizes what we talked about looking at the uh, four quadrants, uh, and I think we're going to move on to talking about stuff. So what do you do with the stuff? I, I'm going to have you go to the next slide. <laughs> We've done going through the uh, covering matrix, so you should have now the brain dump of what's your quadrant one things that are showing up on your brain dump list, what quadrant two things do you have showing up on your brain dump list. Mm -hmm. If you have any quadrant three things, put those, mark those on your brain dump list. Likely you don't have any quadrant four things on your brain dump list, but if you do, you can mark those as well. And then just take a look at what you've got. Is it mostly quadrant one? Is it mostly quadrant two? Three? Four? How do you think you're spending your time? And again, could you shift it a little bit to be more in quadrant two? Uh, Covey says spend 60% of your time in quadrant two, 30% of your time in quadrant one, and 10% in quadrant three, and no time in quadrant four. Again, that's probably unrealistic, and I think it depends on the nature of your job. But again, he's really prioritizing quadrant two because that's where we can get ahead of some things and be a little bit more efficient. Okay, so we're going to talk about styles now. If you are following along in your participant guide, please check uh, page five. But the slides will kind of reveal what's on that page as well. So this is from a book called How to Be Organized in Spite of Yourself. Uh, it's a great read, and we're going to kind of summarize it. And as I talk through these things, I ask you to think about first what you think your own style is. Most of us have multiple styles, so what's the combination of styles? You might have a style at home that's different than your style at work. Uh, you might have a style under pressure that's different than your style on a regular basis when things might be a little bit more humming along. Uh, so just think about your combination of styles. You might also want to think about the people you work with closely, your manager, your direct reports. What do you know about their time management styles? And then be thinking about some of the tips we're going to share and what you might want to do to work with your style. So the first style is a hopper. This is somebody who really enjoys variety, a change of pace, who likes being busy, doesn't mind kind of having a lot of different things going at the same time, likes that feeling of accomplishment, of checking things off. This is a style that I definitely have, and I'll write things on my to-do list just to check them off for that feeling of accomplishment. And I'll be doing many different things throughout the day, but it's really important to kind of stay focused on the bigger picture because I can tend towards that instant gratification of getting things done and not think about some of the weightier projects that might be on my plate or some of those quadrant two things. So if this is you, uh, one, um, there's a bunch of hints there. On those big projects, try to break them down so that you can get that instant gratification. So little next actions, mini goals, uh, creating structure in your day is important so that you can say, okay, I'm going to work on this project in the morning, but I know I'm going to be able to get a lot of different pieces of it done, uh, and then I'll jump to something else in the afternoon. Also kind of getting a sense of how long it takes for you to do things so that you're not just going to the things that are quick, but also saying, I'm going to give myself enough time to get through the things that are most important. So on the other side is our Perfectionist Plus. This is somebody who really has high standards, often likes to do things themselves because they know they can get them done well, will give the time necessary to produce a great product, and will make sure that they're paying attention to the details, getting things right. And this can take a lot of time. So if you know folks who are in this boat, uh, you know that they can spend maybe longer on a project than they could possibly need to get it done, and that can kind of reduce their efficiency. So if this is something that you tend towards, uh, it's really important to think about how to make choices. So where do you want to spend that time? What products or what projects or what deliverables really need that amount of attention? Because there's a lot of things that will benefit 
from that really important orientation to detail, working through actively. And then there's some things that you might be able to delegate or do more quickly or let go of. Um, and so as you're prioritizing, it's really key to say, where am I going to spend this energy and where do I need to just kind of move it along either to somebody else or by getting it done and getting it off my plate. So we have allergic to detail. Um, I like to also think about this uh, as a big picture thinker. So I'm taking Lessinger's uh, names here, but I think all of these styles, there's none that are better or worse than the other. So if you're a big picture thinker, you really like to think about the wider scope of things, to strategize, to have big ideas, to think about how to move forward, how to be futuristic, how to be innovative. Um, and you might not want to spend the time taking those ideas and figuring out how to implement them. Uh, oftentimes, the nature of our roles is if we have to be more big picture thinkers, then we'll adapt to this style and we'll rely on other people to kind of carry things forward or to implement them. Uh, so if you think this might be your style, it is helpful sometimes to partner with others, someone who can help you to have some follow-up procedures, somebody who can help you to figure out how to implement things. When you're thinking about organization and time management, make it as simple as possible. So create routines for yourself where every Monday you do your kind of weekly review and you think about what you need and maybe every Friday afternoon you have a meeting that you always need to have, but keep those routines in place so that you're managing your time without having to think about it too much. Um, and also write things down, but don't make your organizational system too weighty. So it could be just a very simple to-do list with some deadlines. Make it easy for yourself. All right, so you might be a fence sitter. Again, I would probably change this to a deliberate decider if I were writing this book. But this is somebody who wants to take their time to really get their ducks in a row before they move forward with a project. So. They want to collect information, they want to talk things through with people, they want to run things by their stakeholders, and sometimes this can prevent us from getting started. So you're a little bit afraid you might make the wrong move, and that can kind of keep you from jumping in, and sometimes you need some support to kind of go ahead and just move forward. So if this is a style that you respond to that you think you might have, some tips are to think about limiting the choices and limiting the amount of time you spend on preparation. So maybe you say, I'm going to research three different options and I'm going to pick the best one at the end versus I can research 10 or 20 options. Or maybe I'm going to talk to these three people and then I'm going to move ahead. And it's really scoping the work so that you do move forward as necessary. You might need to get input from a friend or really just go with your gut on some things setting deadlines for yourself, uh, small deadlines that help you to move forward and jump into a project. And then the final style, and I think we're all familiar with this and probably guilty of it from time to time, is the cliffhanger style. So this is when you really feel like I do my best work right at deadline, and I really need to push forward to kind of say, I'm going to start that, I'm going to be efficient, I like that pressure. I do really good work when I've got that deadline looming. Um, and that can really turn out well. And sometimes we don't estimate our time right, and we might miss a deadline if we start too late. So, or we might not have the time to do the best job that we want to do. So you know, this gets to procrastination a little bit. Uh, I'll talk in a minute about some other procrastination, um, things that cause procrastination, and how to deal with them. But if you think you might have a cliffhanger style, Think about what the consequence might be for others. So if you don't make that deadline, how might that play out in the workspace? Who might be affected by that? That can motivate you to kind of move up your deadline or create a false deadline or get started on a little piece of it early so you get a sense of how long it might take you. Um, and so all of those kind of things combined can help you to tackle your cliffhanger style if you're following along on your participant guide and you want to just flip ahead, we're gone through pages five, six, and seven. And then there is a note about procrastination on page eight, which is to say, 
we all mean well, and usually we procrastinate for good reason. So either you procrastinate because it's just unpleasant or uninteresting, you know, sometimes you have to just tell yourself I'm procrastinating and move forward and say, I'm just going to get this done. But oftentimes it's because we're either afraid that we might not do it right or it's challenging or we don't know how to go about it uh, or we don't have the support or knowledge or information we need to get started. And in those cases, you need to reach out for the resources you need. You need to kind of break things down into components that help you to move forward. Um, so kind of getting a sense of why you might be procrastinating can help you figure out how to work with it. So if you have any questions about the styles, go ahead and start putting those in the chat box. Um, we'll go to the next slide. And just reflect for a minute. So by now you should have thought a little bit about your own style or what combinations of styles apply to you. Like I said, you might also be thinking about coworkers or your manager or your reports and the styles they have and how you could work with them or help them uh, with some of these hints. If your style hinders you from getting anything done, make a note about that. And then most importantly, what would you like to do about it? We're going to do some action planning at the end here where you can kind of say, here's some things that I picked up and here's some things I'd like to stop doing or start doing or continue doing based on my style. So just reflect for a minute here about your style, how it might get in the way and what you might like to do about it. Okay, so hopefully you um, are taking some things about your style. We're going to move on to talk about processing. Uh, no matter what your style, making good choices about the stuff coming at you is important. Uh, the two models that this slide refers to are in your participant guide. So flip to part one, the five decisions, which should be page nine. Um, we can have Talia bring that up. So I want you to look around your office right now and see if there's any piles of paper that haven't been processed. Do me a favor and don't go into your email right now because I know we might lose you, but that's another place where there's lots of things that might need to be processed. You might be looking at your desk and seeing a number of sticky notes. You might see meeting notes that need to be processed. There's all sorts of things around you. As we talk about these decisions, feel free to pick up one of those piles and kind of start to process it. So usually you pick it up and you have one of five decisions to make. So you might pick it up and say, you know, actually, I don't need this and I can disregard it. There's no action item associated with it. I can throw it away. I can file it away. Maybe it shouldn't have come to me in the first place. I know I'm looking around my office right now and I see a stack of magazines that I'm not likely to read. I should probably just get those things out of my life. Uh, so that's kind of a step that we often don't think about is things come at us so quickly, sometimes you need to just disregard them and get them out of your life as well. And same thing with email, hit that delete button or archive things or think about whether you want to unsubscribe to one of those lists that you never get to read Getting the volume down is going to be a big part of making good decisions. The next one is delegate. So you might pick up a piece of paper and ask yourself, am I actually the right person to do this? And we don't all have direct reports to delegate to, but I still encourage you to think that through, to say, if it's a really busy time, maybe somebody else can pick up and you can do something for them at another time. Or maybe there's a team member who's really good at something and they're the better person to do it. Or maybe if you're working in sort of an academic department, you can use teaching staff or students or you can get an intern or uh, some summer help 
think about ways you can delegate even if it's not clear that you have people to delegate to. Another thing, you might pick up a piece of paper now and say, I could get this done right away. Do it. That's the take immediate action. David Allen has a rule that if you take nothing away from this webinar, take this away. It's the two-minute rule. And the rule is, if it's going to take two minutes or less, just do it. I'll let that sink in for a minute. That is a self-discipline tool. It's nothing that you have to organize or you know work into a schedule. It's just getting used to saying, I think I could make that phone call right now and get it done and leave that message. Or I think I could send that email reply and get it off my plate. Um, the just do it, the two minute rule, that can really be an effective way to get through things more quickly when you're processing. Um, now I wanna make some caveats here. It's not the 10 minute rule, so Oftentimes you start to do something and then you realize it's gonna take you longer than two minutes. Okay, then stop and move on to the next part of the decision tree. Um, you might wanna modify the rule if you, depending on your work, but just think carefully about times that you're processing actively. So some of us have the tendency to be in email all day long and that can get in the way of getting some of our bigger projects done. So. You might want to take certain times out of the day where you process your email and other parts of the day where you're just kind of checking in. So maybe in the morning, you process, you follow the two-minute rule, you make sure that you've attended to things, and then you move to projects and kind of monitor your email. Then in the afternoon or around lunchtime, you do it again, and then at the end of the day. But you don't want to necessarily process your email and make these five decisions constantly. You need to set aside time to do that. All right, you might pick up a piece of paper and say, well, this is something I wanna reference, this is something I wanna hold on to, but I don't necessarily need to do anything with it. So having a good filing system to put that away for file up, that's great. We're gonna talk more about uh, also follow, filing for follow up when it is something you have to do. Uh, that's gonna be the part two piece. What do you wanna do to really make sure that you do get back to those things? So. I think I flipped the reference file and the file for follow up there. Um, if you have any questions on part one, go ahead and put those in the box. We'll get to them soon. Um, and now we're going to move on to part two. Okay, so as we all know, there's a lot of things that we have to do that we can't delegate, that we know are going to take more than two minutes. So we want to kind of figure out how to capture those for later. Um, I like the idea of the ubiquitous capture tool. So where are you putting those to-do items? Um, so next actions, that can be your to-do list. I personally keep mine on Outlook because I'm in there every day. It could be a paper to-do list, wherever you wanna do this, but I would definitely say when you have it, put the deadline on it and make sure that you are kind of monitoring that, keeping it up to date, processing it as well, so that it doesn't get stale, but it's an active, helpful to-do list. Um, Covey and Alan sometimes discuss doing to-do lists that are specific to the context. Uh, again, I like to have it all in one place, um, but as you can see here, you could have an office to-do list or a store to-do list, that kind of thing. Some people are wanting to separate personal and professional. I think that usually makes sense. Um, but it all depends on the nature of your work. Again, this is part where you customize so it works best for you. If you are interested in how you can do this in Outlook, uh, at the end of this, I'll send you a link to another webinar that we did, which is getting organized with Outlook. Uh, and that whole webinar walks through how to process things according to these methods using your Outlook tool. Uh, so projects, it's just important to note that Oftentimes you either get a project uh, in your email or in a meeting and you need to break that down into a project plan and then you need to figure out what the next action is. Just like with a, uh, something you wanna put on your to-do list, break that project down, have a ongoing kind of project to-do list and work through that and make sure you integrate it into your whole system. Waiting for is important because when you delegate you can't just assume somebody's got it done. So you might wanna put on your to-do list, follow up with so-and-so, 
on Friday or whatever you need to do to kind of keep track of the things that you've delegated. I like Sunday maybe because I think this is a place that we can get tripped up. So we might be in uh, the habit of letting things stick around in our inbox that don't have that real clear to do, but at some point you might like to do it. Those are the things that we sometimes come back to and back to and read over and over. If you have something like that, like learn Spanish, take a trip to Florida, or maybe more likely something you want to read or something that you want to spend some time thinking about, file that in a separate place outside of your inbox, a someday maybe folder, and just check in there every week or every month, whatever makes sense for you, and pull things out that you really do want to put some urgency and a deadline behind. And otherwise, you can either get rid of them when you decide you're not interested anymore, or you can just kind of keep checking in. But don't let those things stick in your inbox. Make sure your inbox is as active and current uh, as necessary as possible. And finally, I'm a huge fan of using your calendar to keep yourself organized. So if you have to do items that might take um, half an hour, an hour, or more, put those right into your calendar somewhere. You can mark the time as uh, free so that people can still schedule things if you need to move them around um, if you're concerned about that. But then when you come in in the morning and you look at your to-do list, you can also look at your calendar and get a real sense of how much time do I have today, what big things do I need to get done, uh, and when might I have time to do them. And then you can make good choices. So if some of those quadrant one things come up, you can say, okay, I had blocked out the afternoon for this. I'm going to need to move that. I'll move it to tomorrow, but you're making that choice very carefully. Uh, so that's the second part of the processing. Again, if you have questions, please type them into the chat box, um, and we will come back to it. So again, you can kind of think about all the different gathering places if you want to look in your um, participant guide on the next page. We have a whole list from lynda.com of places that you might find to-dos hiding uh, in your car, on your calendar, um, in your email, in your filing cabinet. I don't mean to scare anybody. Um, oftentimes when we do the brain dump, people either have one or two reactions. They feel very relieved to kind of get it out of their head and on paper and not be reminded of things all the time. Or they feel very stressed because they see it all in front of them. So. This gathering process is really about making sure that it's not in your head, it's captured somewhere so that you can begin to sort it, you can begin to process it, you can begin to decide when and what to do with it, and really take control over some of that stress that's caused by feeling like you constantly have things that you need to do and you haven't figured out when or how to do them. Um, all right, so we'll do some action planning. The last few pages in your participant guide have just kind of a review of things to think about when managing your time. Start with your goals, break them down into manageable tasks, think about how you're spending your time. If there's places you could be more efficient, think about the patterns you might be having, some of your stylistic pieces, um, and then really scheduling things in your to-do list, in your calendar, um, and then over time, continuously improving. I like to say, before we move into action planning, we usually have people all over the map who attend these types of programs, people who are just looking to pick up some tips, uh, but generally like their system and feel like they manage their time pretty well, to people who are saying, I really want to do better, I want to change some things significantly. Um, if you're in that ladder boat, just think carefully about how much you want to commit to off the bat. You might need to kind of isolate some of your backlog and start from where you are today. Uh, so on the second to last page, page 14 of your participant guide, or in a Word document, or uh, in, you know, on whatever paper you have around that you want to capture this, just take a few minutes now to put anything that you think you want to remember that we talked about. Maybe it's the two-minute rule. Maybe it's spending more time in quadrant two, 
Maybe it's making those uh, decisions and processing at different points of the day. Maybe it's some of the hints you picked up about your own style. Whatever it is you want to remember, capture that somewhere. And then the action planning piece is something you might want to stop doing or do differently or continue doing. If there's any real concrete actions, write those down. Maybe you want to try the two-minute rule nonstop for the rest of the day or whatever it is. Uh, that's completely up to you. Um, so while people are doing some action planning and learning, you can also be entering more questions. Um, I'll kick it back to Talia and see where we are with, do we have any questions? Do you have some questions? I just want to give everyone a couple minutes mm -hmm. just to think about if you have anything else, and then we'll gather those and we'll get right back to you. Okay, so a couple minutes to think about questions, action plan, and we'll be right back. Okay, we've got some great questions coming in. Hopefully you've got some good action plans in front of you. Uh, the very last page of your participant guide has a whole list of additional resources. So we always like to plug Harvard Manage Mentor, which is free online professional development from the business school. Uh, you can access it through the link there. It's also their link in your participant guide. Uh, I'm happy to share these slides with everybody after the presentation. So. Uh, whichever is easiest for you. Lynda.com, also a free professional development resource online, has a tremendous amount on getting organized and time management, um, and you see the list in your participant guide. And then some of the gurus that we've pulled from today have their own websites, so you can kind of continue to learn from them. Um, a number of books are also listed in your participant guide, and uh, there's some related classes that we can send as well uh, in that email to follow up. So I'm going to take the first set of questions. All right, so we got some pretty good questions on the styles. The first one was, you know, what if four out of five, all the styles, what if a bunch of the styles seem to apply to me? How do I deal with that? So that's a great question. Uh, sometimes people can see all five of them. Uh, usually you have some tendencies, like I said, they might be in certain contexts, so professional or personal, your style might change or when you're under pressure versus when you're in a very comfortable space. Um, but I would say some of the themes, um, timing, getting a sense of how long it takes you to do things, I think across the styles, that can be an important one. Um, another theme is getting support, so looking for somebody with a different style or, um, again, if it's a different context, 
helping you with some of the time management things there, so support across any of the styles is important. Um, and then I think some of those simple structures, making sure you have a good to-do list system, some simple routines, I think those are things that can benefit all the styles as well. So uh, I think there's some common takeaways. So we also had a specific question about the hopper style, the one that likes to hop, hop, hop and check things off. So one of the hints for the hopper style said, approach frustration, anxiety, and boredom in a positive, productive manner. How do you do that? <laughs> that was a good catch uh, to that uh, questioner, and we pulled these things from the book. So uh, I would say um, when you're thinking about, you know, where do those frustrations come from or the anxieties or the boredom, it kind of goes back to that procrastination, like what is the cause of this? So am I frustrated because I just don't like doing this work, and then how can I make it? How can I motivate myself to do it? So maybe you just say, you know, I'll feel so much better when this is off my plate. Or maybe, again, you get some support and you say, can you sit with me while we work through this together because I'm just in a frustrated place? Or So those kind of things to just help you kind of power through um, in terms of the things that you might be more anxious about. Again, it might be a lack of clarity on what you're supposed to do or you might be feeling like what you're supposed to do is not the thing that you think you should be doing. So sometimes it's having some conversation to get past the anxiety. Um, a lot of this is about mindset. So when we feel overwhelmed, when we feel frustrated, sometimes it's a time to say, okay, what is, is my just, just having too much? Maybe I take some time to process and then I can feel like, okay, I've got it under control and now I'll focus again. So. Um, I think it's really cueing into where those emotions are coming from and then trying to strategize how do I get out from under this um, and then having a positive and open mindset that I can do it, I will do it, and I'll get support if I need it. So we did have a pretty specific question, which was great, about simple apps or websites that could be used for organizing. This question was specifically around project planning and project tasks. We do have a nice list of recommended apps that we put together that we can send out afterwards, and Sarah had expressed that one was definitely very good for project planning. So we'll send that out if anyone has interest in that, just as an FYI. And if people have some that they want to put in the chat box right now that they would advocate for apps that you're using, like I said, I tend to use more simple tools. I'm in Outlook every day, so I use that. We have Word, we have Excel. I tend to use those tools because they're just easy and accessible. I always like to make the caution about tools that make sure that you use one that's really going to support your organization and not necessarily be clunky or cumbersome. So kind of the minimal tool that you can use to really help you get organized, I think you don't want to lose time to learning a tool or going through a tool that might be over-complicating the picture. So. Um, and feel free to put any tools you would recommend in the chat box. So we got a really good question coming in, which I think most of us have faced and many times. How do you avoid getting derailed? How do you keep the process going? Mm -hmm. So as you look through your brain dumps, and if you saw a lot of quadrant threes, or if in the middle of this webinar <laughs> you've had somebody come at you with a quadrant three, uh, I have to say that little box if your own outlook that pops up in the corner and says you have a message, that can be a big derailer. So a lot of it's knowing how well you work. If you're a hopper, you might be comfortable with that kind of jumping in and around, but you can get lost. Um, but I would say knowing the nature of your work is the first thing. So do you have work where you really do have to be responsive all day long? then you might need to set up some very simple kind of ways of working with it, like sending a quick email in response, I'll get back to you by the end of the day, or um, having times when you let things go to voicemail and then batching them and going through all your voicemails. Um, batching is just a good way to kind of deal with all the little quadrant things, three things that you have to do in one big swoop. Um, but on the bigger things, it might be having conversations with the people you work with about, you know, um, there was just an email that came out from the executive vice president talking about collectively at Harvard, we might want to think about things like meeting free Fridays or email free 
Monday mornings or whatever it is, those are more collective conversations. So if you know your whole team is derailed or you're all emailing too much or there's a lot of interruption because you have an open door policy, you might need to be having some conversations with people you work with most closely. And also just to add to that, in order to avoid getting derailed, don't overwhelm yourself trying to get organized or manage your time. Pick something, stick with it, add another thing. Start from here. Don't try and go back and organize the thousands of emails that are already in your inbox that you maybe can't do anything about. Start today and move forward. So don't overwhelm yourself probably at the same time. So another question we got coming in is, what if you have limited control over the number of deliverables and the timeline for those deliverables? So you're not in control of them. How can you use this to manage that? Mm -hmm. And so this gets a little bit to project management. I'm assuming you're talking about several large projects that have deadlines, that have a lot of moving parts. I would definitely say project management is a good um, kind of skill to master alongside this. So you might want to get some training in that. But uh, we all have to make these choices. So that's the um, kind of rub of it, is we all want to be able to do everything all the time. And usually when it's not possible, something has to give. So if the deadlines aren't being um, put together by you, who are they being put together by? Usually it's your stakeholders. You probably need to have some conversations with them and say, here's the big picture. Here's where I think we might not be um, able to make our deadline. Again, project management, there's a tool called the triple constraint and just talking about the trade-offs between time, quality, um, and cost. So if you want me to meet this deadline, here's what I'm going to need in terms of time. Here's what the quality will look like. Or if you want that kind of quality product, here's how much time I might need, and I might need some extra support. So everything is a trade-off, and that's some good language to use to kind of talk about what those trade-offs are so that you can be successful. Because in the end, if you have a project and all the deadlines are the same and you have a massive um, deliverable to put in, talking about what that might look like, what the quality would be, what you might need for support, how long you would really want to have and what it might look like if you have to stick to this timeline. There's a conversation there you might have to push through, but just think about what gives, um, and usually it's the quality. So another question that's sort of around things that are external to you, you don't have control over, is getting emails in off work, is out, off work hours. How would you deal with that? That's a big one, um, and I think, again, it's cultural around Harvard, so uh, that's one of those ones where I would say kind of getting a sense of, is this the work culture in which I am placed? And again, going back to EVP, kind of trying to set it from the above, it's not what Harvard wants people to have to do, and we're trying to kind of help people to manage that. So. You can kind of have conversation or put up an out of office or you know those kinds of things to set some boundaries. Um, and if it's the culture that you're expected to be answering those things, having a conversation about what that means in terms of your work and what that means in terms of your time. Um, we are kind of in a place where work is shifting. There's a new work environment. And if you're expected to be available after regular business hours, there should be a conversation about how available you need to be and how to set you up for success there. All right, so the last question we had come through, I like very much, it's about daydreaming. Yeah. So let's say, you know, you're working on a project, you get distracted, you start daydreaming, you stare at your computer for 10 minutes and don't do anything. Do we have any tips for kind of dealing with that? Uh, so that's some of that quadrant four stuff, and I think it's absolutely something that's going to happen, and it usually happens when you're just feeling like, oh, man, I've been at it. My brain is fried. I just need to look out the window. So I would say think about if there's something quadrant two that can kind of get you back on track. You might not be able to jump right into the thick of the work, but maybe you just get up and take a walk, or maybe you go talk to a colleague um, and break up our bodies are not designed to work 24-7, so 
we have these Arudian cycles, I believe they're called, that you know you can really only focus for 90 to uh, 120 minutes. So if you haven't taken a physical break, then your brain's going to take a break and you're going to start daydreaming or you're going to do um, whatever, and you might lose efficiency just by not taking that physical break. So I would say that's usually a sign you need a break, get up, you know, just get a drink of water, anything, come back and see if that helps you to refocus. All right, well, if anyone has any last minute questions, now is the time. We have a couple more minutes. So we'll give you guys just a couple minutes, see if anything else comes through, and then we will finish up. All right, everyone, we had one more question come through, which we definitely hear a lot from a lot of people, understandably. It's about tips for helping your boss managing up to manage their time better. So I think it does go back to the style and kind of recognizing, is my boss maybe a perfectionist and therefore spending a lot of time on one thing and therefore not getting to other things? Are they a cliffhanger? And so it's more of a, like, they need a deadline to get going. Um, maybe they're a big picture thinker and they need you to help them to figure out how to implement. Um, so first I would say just try to think about their style. If you don't know what their style is, sometimes it's worth having a conversation with them about their work style. You might not want to say, I think you might be this style, but uh, to get their input. Um, and then I would say trying to, again, make simple, supportive um, interventions. So I used to work for somebody uh, when I needed to get receipts uh, at my first job at Harvard, and I never got the receipts, so I just put a sticker on their credit card and put receipts on it, and then I got a lot of receipts because of the time that they were spending that money and had the receipt in hand, they got a kind of reminder from me that I would need that later. So uh, you can do really simple things. Maybe it's setting up an inbox that's just for your things, or maybe it's uh, another tip we have um, is the 5 by 15 report. So it takes you 15 minutes to write, your boss 5 minutes to read. It's just a way of kind of at the end of the week maybe putting together here's everything that, you know, we did this week, here's what's pending, here's open questions, whatever it is. But uh, again, you need to know your boss's style. Would they rather you just pop in your their office and kind of talk about those things or would they rather have something to read? Uh, so I think a lot of it is having the conversation with your boss and then thinking about some of those quick, simple things. Um, given the nature of the webinar, it's hard to do any kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching or question answering. So if I haven't adequately answered anybody's question, after I send the email, feel free to shoot an email off and we can keep the conversation going. Or you can pick up the phone and we can talk some more um, to help get to some of the nuances of your particular boss or your particular situation. And if anyone is interested, since we have had the topics come up, we do have a project management class in September. It's at the end of September on September 25th, if anyone is interested in that. We did just have a session of managing up. The next one is not going to be until January 28th. But that's definitely open. It is at the Longwood campus. So if anyone's interested in sort of following up more on those topics, please feel free to enroll. We would love to have you. And we also have managing multiple bosses, which gets into how much time management even gets kind of more difficult yeah. if you have 
multiple bosses, so that might be something we can send you the dates for that as well. Well, thank you everyone very much for attending. It was wonderful having you. Sarah will send her follow-up email with a lot of great tips and documents, and we hope to see you back again for another webinar or for class here at CWD. Thank you all for coming. It was nice to have such a full webinar audience. Uh, it was nice talking with you all today, and I hope to see you in an in-person class or a future webinar. Thanks so much.